remind you of Vision 2024. Anybody remember Vision 2024? First, seek the kingdom. When we seek the kingdom, we figure out, you know what? It's all about Jesus anyways. It's not the American kingdom. It's not the Jewish kingdom. It's his kingdom. Amen? Amen. Tonight, I'm going to try to get through all my notes, or at least the majority of my notes, so pray for me, okay? Just stretch your hands towards me and pray for me now. Yes, I receive it, Lord. Help me to compact this a lot of goodness in here. I'll get through all of it tonight. We might be here until tomorrow, but that's all right. Amen. I receive that. If you have your Bibles, would you open up to Acts chapter number 2? This is the birthday of the church. This is the chapter of the birthday of the church. This is when the Holy Spirit was poured out on God's people. And guess what? They did a few things together. All right? Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter number 2, verses 42 through 47. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and open them up. If you don't have your Bibles, it's on the that screen or that screen or my screen okay this is talking about a brand new church this is talking about a life that is Christ centered and a Christ centered life is kingdom centered life they talking about the new believers devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer that's just one verse and there's a lot i cannot pack there and I, yes i will verse 43 everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles all the believers were together and had everything in common they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Jeremy, thank you for water. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved turn to your neighbor remind them the title of my message tonight is christ-centered life is kingdom centered life come on say it again christ-centered life is kingdom centered life jumping back to verse 42 the first thing that we see is that they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching why is that important? Why is that the first thing that they did? Somebody help me out. Why is that the first thing that they did is that, that uh, verse number 42, please. Why is it that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings? Well, the apostles were with Jesus. The, the apostles just came out of the best theology class you could possibly have, and they were all about his kingdom remember just a couple of verses ago peter and a couple of the apostles said jesus is this when you are restoring the kingdom to israel and jesus said no 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 you have no idea what you're asking about but i am restoring my kingdom and the apostles when they were filled with the holy spirit they were not about the jewish kingdom the american kingdom they were about god's kingdom and the, the lord honored that and many were added daily. Somebody say daily. See, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 tell us that all Scripture is God-breathed. Say it with me. All Scripture is God-breathed, God-inspired. And it's important for us to understand that the apostles were speaking the words of of Jesus and when they were speaking the words of Jesus what was happening was is those words were useful somebody say useful for teaching 
rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Why are all those things important? Why are all those things important? Well, verse 17 explains it to us, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So why is it important to be involved in teaching, in listening and teaching? Why is that important? Because we must be trained for righteousness. Thank you. I, I, I need one of those in a second. In righteousness let me say righteousness because we got a job to do we have a job to do turn to, your, turn to your neighbor tell them you have a job to do I have a job to do come on point to yourself as well because it's easier to tell somebody else they got a job to do but it's a lot harder to tell yourself I got a job to do I must be devoted to the teaching of the Bible amen because it is God breathed and when the apostles were speaking, remember, they didn't have the written New Testament like we do. We are so spoiled, it's not even funny. How many actually read the, your, uh, your passages every day? Okay, about half of us, good. What happened to the other half? Well, I'm glad that you're here tonight because you get to be um, inspired, okay? You get to be inspired to get yourself into the Word and get into the biblical teaching. But here's the thing, why do we need to get into the teaching? Why do we have to get into the teaching? Well, get to know the Lord better, but we got a job to do. You just told yourself, I got a job to do, remember? Come on, turn, help yourself out and say, I got a job to do. And the job that I got to do comes from the Great Commission. I remember the Great Commission found in Matthew 28. Well, let's go there together. Matthew 28, I'm going to just read verses 19 and 20 for you. Therefore... Who is Jesus talking to, therefore? All of us, we're the disciples of Jesus, right? Therefore, go, sit or go? We like to sit. Come on, we get comfortable on our blessed assurance. It gets bigger and bigger by the second we sit on it. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always at the very end of the age. See, the apostles were able to make other disciples because disciples make disciples. Say it with me. Disciples make disciples. A healthy church is a church that is a growing church. A church that is not growing is not a healthy church. Amen. How do you know if you're in a healthy church? because well, you're growing go back to verse number 42 acts chapter 2 verse 42 the second part is say with me fellowship living waters fellowship church oh i wonder if that was taken right out of that come on fellowship i was told by an individual sitting in the way back today that a fellow fellowship is a fellow in a ship is that true two fellows in a ship i gotta get that correctly sorry fellowship you can't fellowship by yourself amen you can't have fellowship by yourself you cannot fellowship by yourself you, listen if you're talking to yourself you got to get out and get some friends come on this is a good place to get some friends come on turn to your name and tell them you are my friend you are my friend you are my friend back there you are my friend okay people people in the sound booth you are my friends people on you are my friends and I enjoy coming here because I get to fellowship with you amen why is fellowship important come on help me out why is fellowship important huh community but we'll get to community in a second why else is fellowship important encouragement strength well how about we go to Hebrews chapter 10 verses 24 and 25 and let us consider how we may spur one another towards love and good deeds okay why is fellowship important to spur to encourage each other to do something good if I don't come here who's going to encourage me to do something good listen the world out there is dark 
I don't know if you know that or not, but Isaiah chapter 60 says the world's going to get darker. And if the world's getting darker, I need you and you need me in order to spur each other to doing something good. Verse 25, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. I wonder if the writer of Hebrews lived in 2020. Because 2020 taught us how to have church online. And listen, I praise God for church online. I praise God for Zoom, for those of you who can't be here in person. But there's, some, there's something special about coming together. I need you some water. I'm getting excited. Can you tell? I got a lot of notes and very little time to get through it. Thank you, sir. I'm going to keep preaching. 2020 taught us how to be separated. Yes, and now many people are walking through those doors for the very first time. Yes, four years later, some people have not yet walked through those doors. Why? Because it's a habit. I don't know about you, but I have a very comfortable spot in my house where I go to relax. Anybody else have a very comfortable spot in your house? Oh, every hand is up. Praise the Lord. You what? Well, outside, but you have a very comfortable spot that you would sit there all day and not move for the rest of your life. Come on, somebody. Yes, you do. Amen. Yeah. So it is easy to forget about coming here, and it's easy to, listen, I can watch church online, and if I miss the sermon on Sunday, the pastor's going to cut out his, his part of the sermon. We're going to get rid of the worship team. We're going to get the, uh, rid of the, all the prayer. We just want the word. That's all I want is just the teaching. But what about fellowship? What about the fellowship? Fellowship is that important because when we fellowship together, we spur each other to good works. Amen? The last part of verse 25. All the more as you see the day approaching. Which day are we talking about? The, the day of return of the Lord Jesus. How many know that Jesus is coming back soon? Oh, Jesus is coming back soon. Come on, turn to your neighbor. Push your neighbor and tell him, Jesus is coming back soon. I need you here in this church as often as I, I, you can possibly be here. Because I, I, I don't want you to miss the elevator going up. Amen? I'm going to spur you to some good works. Go back to our, our text, Acts chapter 2, verse number 42. The next part. After fellowship, we find the breaking of bread and prayers. I wonder why the breaking of bread and prayers is together. Somebody help me out. Why is the breaking of bread and prayers together? This is Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Why is the breaking of bread and prayer, why is it together? They are important, but why are they so important? Well, go ahead. He was with his disciples, absolutely. But can I tell you why? When you are praying together, okay, you get hungry. Amen. Come on, turn to anybody and tell them I get hungry. By the way, by the way, healings are the is the bread of your of uh, of every believer of the children. This is biblical. I'm not making this stuff up. When do we see healings? Johnny, when do we see healings? When we pray, of course. Why not? When we pray, we see healings. Amen? When we pray for each other, we see God move. And that is our bread. But in reality, the reason why when you break bread together, you know what the other person is thinking. How many have ever eaten together? And when you eat together, you find out something about the other person. Amen? Listen, I, uh, the other day I had a beautiful lunch with a pastor friend of mine. And as we broke bread together, when we had lunch together, I got to know him a lot better. And at the end of this meeting, we got to pray together and we got to see the Lord move together. That is beautiful. I don't know if you understand it or not, but that is beautiful. But also, somebody said earlier, that this is what Jesus did. Luke chapter 22, verse 19. And he took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
Each time we come together, each time we break bread together, we are reminded that we are the body of Christ. You and I, we are the body of Christ. And listen, when we break bread together, we want to pray for each other. Amen. Have you ever gone to somebody, to another believer's house and not prayed after, after you guys had lunch together? Oh, nobody, right? We, for some reason, when we believers, when we come together, whether we eat together or not, we're going to pray together. By the way, a family that prays together stays together. Oh, you already know. A, a family breaks bread together, amen, and they pray together and they stay together. Nothing better than eating together. Let's have lunch. I'm getting hungry. Or dinner. Acts chapter 2, verse 43. Signs and wonders followed the believers. Say it with me. Signs and wonders followed the believers. Why is that important? Why, is, why are signs and wonders important when believers come together? We already believe. We already know. We have knowledge. Say with me. I have knowledge. I have understanding. The Lord has deposited wisdom. Why do I need to any, so any more signs and wonders? To be, a to, to be a good witness. Absolutely. Listen, plus Jesus in Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18 said, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. That is important because we got to get those demons out. Amen. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on the sick people and they will get well. Are we seeing all these things? Absolutely. Is it, do I need to bring, bring in a few snakes just so we can pet a few snakes? No, no. Let's not test God, okay? Let's not test God. But, but at the same time, if you are put in a situation with some poison, guess what happens? The blood of Jesus is stronger than any poison. Somebody say amen. The blood of Jesus is stronger than any attack of the enemy. Amen. The blood of Jesus is there to cover you in your time of need. Signs and wonders must accompany a church that is on fire. By the way, this is a church that is on fire. This is a church where we are seeing healings, miracles, signs, and wonders. And we're about to see more. Come on, somebody say more. Oh, we're about to see more. Greater things are yet to come. I promise you, God is on the move, and God is about to show off his glory. Acts chapter 2, verse 44. Go with me, Acts chapter 2, verse 44. This next part, I want to talk about generosity. Somebody say generosity. And the believers were together and had everything in common this does not mean that you need to go sell your house your possessions and bring everything to church don't do that unless the lord speaks to you okay unless the lord speaks to you don't do that but generosity is a sign that god's kingdom is at hand i, I am looking at some very generous people i'm looking at some very generous people i know some of you online are very generous as well listen when i look right over there in that corner over there i see some generosity happening over there listen when the spirit of god moves in a place we have abundance somebody say abundance and when we have abundance what do we do we gotta share the wealth amen listen it's it's not okay to be greedy Say with me, it's not okay to be greedy, but it is important to be generous. And the Lord loves a generous giver. First John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18 helps us out. And it says, if anyone has material possession and sees a brother or a sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can, they, how can the love of God be in that, in that person? 
Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with action and in truth. Generosity is the love of God because, listen, can I tell you about myself? Everything that the Lord has given me, he has given me. It is not by my wisdom. It's not by my might. It's not by my understanding. It has nothing to do with me. It is the Lord that gave me everything. Amen? It is the Lord that gave me everything. The other day, I met one of my uh, Muslim friends, and he just uh, purchased a very nice piece of property. And in the past, when he asked me about my house or whatever, I would say, the Lord gave that to me. And he said, finally, your Lord is blessing me. I said, listen, my God can bless you above and beyond what you can imagine or even ask for. Amen. But you got to give him the glory. Whether he believes it or not, but it is the Lord that gave him that property. It is the Lord that supplied his need, right? And he, looking at me, he gave God glory. He may not believe in him, but he started to give God glory. And would, I wouldn't be surprised if in just a couple of days, he was going to walk through those doors and give his life to the Lord Jesus. Amen. This is what generosity does. Our God is a generous God. Come on, turn to your name and tell him. Our God is a generous God. He gives more than we need. There is an abundance in the house of the Lord. Acts chapter 2. Verse 45. Acts chapter 2, verse 45. They sold property and possessions and gave to anyone who had need. If the church of 2024 was as generous as the church, as the first church, Nobody in this place would have a need. Come on, 13 and tell them. If the church in 2024 was as generous as the church of the as the first church, nobody would have a need. It's true. I'm glad, I'm glad that you agree with me. Praise God. I got one more. I, uh, one more to agree with me. I just need one more person to agree with me. I got another one to agree, another one to agree, another one to agree. If the church in 2024 was, thank you for agreeing with me, was as generous as the first church, nobody in here would have a need. I'm not talking about being greedy. I'm talking about giving to those in need. And listen, the Lord multiplied daily those that were getting saved. Amen? Now jump to verse 46. Jump to verse 46. Verse 46, Acts chapter 2, verse 46. Daily gathering and worshiping. They were daily gathering and worshiping with sincere hearts and gladness. Listen, I don't know about you, but I would be here every single day. Whether I be the pastor here or not, I would be here every single day. Anybody else? Oh, yeah, praise God. We have plenty of time we get together throughout uh, the week. We have Sunday morning, amen? We have Sunday night. We have Monday night Bible study. We have Wednesday midweek service. That's where we are today, amen? Friday, 1 p.m., we get together and we pray. Listen, if you are looking for a place to gather, there is a house of God open just about every day here. Why is it important to gather worship with glad and sincere hearts listen my children when they were little they were dragged to church i'm going to say it one more time when my children were little they were dragged to church in 2024 my children dragged me to church it's true true story my children sometimes get here a lot a lot earlier than i do Yes, Rihanna and Jeremy and William need to practice and whatnot. And sometimes, you know, the house needs to be cleaned up or whatnot. They drag me here. They say, hey, Dad, uh, you know, it's 6 p.m. Where are you? You're supposed to be here already. Church starts in 30 minutes. Look at my phone. I'll show you the text message, okay? 
Amen. I'm telling you the truth. Sunday morning, my, my children leave the house before I do. You know why? Because they know they need to come and practice because the presence of God is important. Worship is important. And I know some of you don't believe that worship is important. I know that some of you don't even believe that coming to church is important. But let me tell you, the first century church thought it was important that they gathered daily. Why? Why? Somebody help me. Why? Well, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 helps us, and it says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. My children drag me to church, and I am glad. I was glad when, they said my, when my children said to me, Come to the house of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I get excited when others invite me to church services because I want to be here. Not because I want to preach every single time. Trust me, putting a message together takes a, a lot of time and a lot of hours. But it is worth it. Come on, turn to your neighbor and tell them it is worth it. It is worth it. It is worth it. Why? I want to do this because I have gratitude in my heart. I have a song that God put in my heart, and though I may be off key, come on, Stan, tell him I may be off key, but God has put that, play, that uh, song in my heart. Our time is flying. I don't know why our time is flying. I got two, I got two more points to go. Okay, we do two more points. Is that okay, people? Praise God. Listen, I'm only doing what God told me to do. I'm only doing what is written here in just a couple of verses. Acts chapter 2, verse, what, what, what verse are we in? Verse, uh, what's this about? Verse 46. Acts chapter 2, verse 46. Go back to verse 46. There it is. No, uh, sorry, verse 47. My apologies. I, see, I, I, I'm wrong at times. I admit my mistakes. Okay. Uh, praising God and enjoying the favor with people. I don't know about you, but a couple of weeks ago when we were, well, let's start with a couple of months ago, a month and a half ago, when we had a service back here, we got some threats. Let me remember that. We prayed and the threats were removed. But the authorities gave us favor. Do you know why? Because we were not confrontational. I know some of you wanted me to go to certain houses and knock on the door and invite them and start a confrontation, but I'm glad that God gave me some wisdom and the rest of you prayed for me, for God to give me wisdom. I pray for wisdom all the time, amen? Favor and wisdom, amen. I know some of you want, like a confrontation, I'm not a confrontational guy. I love favor and wisdom, amen, amen. Why do I like favor and wisdom? Because it's a lot easier if you have favor with other people to reach them for Jesus. Even when I'm put in a confrontational situation, I try to love on somebody. You know why I try to love on somebody? Because love conquers everything. Say with me, love conquers everything. I understand that we're in the month of June and people say love is love, but I don't drink toilet water. Amen? What love, true love, has to be exhibited. And a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago when we had the unity service in Springfield, a young lady decided to come and have a confrontation. And she started with a confrontation with my wife, Rihanna, David, William. And they were very nice to her. They were very loving for, to her. And she decided that that, was not, that love was not enough. She went and she started confronting Pastor D, who was preaching. For those of you who were with us, you remember. For those of you who were not there with us, go back and watch the video, the unity service at the Springfield Wesleyan Church. 
And Pastor D was not confrontational with her. She, she offered to pray for her. She offered to love upon her, but she did not want any of that. This, this young lady wanted a confrontation, but I'm glad for the favor of God. Come on, somebody say it with me. I'm glad for the favor of God because the favor of God drew that woman out. We never kicked her out. It was the favor of God that drew her out of there. And everybody else in the neighborhood, for those of you who were not there, you didn't hear, but some clap when she left. Not the people in the, under the tent. People outside were clapping when, when she left. Amen. Why? Because there is favor. Somebody say favor. I love favor. And here's the thing about favor. Jesus had a lot of favor. How do I know that? How do you know that? Luke chapter 2, verse 52. I'm glad you asked. Luke 52, chapter 2, verse 52 says, Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and in favor with God and man. Listen, if it was important, if favor was important for Jesus, it might as well be important for me. Come on. If favor was important for Jesus, it might be it's more important to me. Amen? Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and in favor with both with God, his Father, and the men around him. And listen, when we have favor, go back to Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 47. When we have favor with God and others, here goes my last point. I'm ready for my last point. Let's read verse 47 together, okay? And the Lord, say it with me, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Growth in community, growth in any healthy organization is important. Come on, turn to your name and tell them, growth in any organization is important. God blesses good fruit. Listen, John chapter 15, the whole chapter, go home and read all of John chapter 15. What, what you will find is that God wants fruit. God wants fruit, and he will have fruit at all costs. Come on, turn to your name and tell him, God's going to have fruit at all costs. Sometimes he's got to prune. Is pruning comfortable? No. But bearing fruit is comfortable. Is it? No. But what's the alternative? Chopped off and thrown in the fire. I don't want that. I'm sorry, but I don't want that. And I don't want living waters to be that church that is chopped off and thrown in the fire. I don't want that. There's enough churches dying around. I don't want living waters to be an example of that. Amen? Maybe the problem is that there's not enough harvest. How many have ever prayed, Lord, send in the harvest? I've did. I've prayed that. Can I tell you that the Lord doesn't have a problem with the harvest? The Lord has a problem with the harvesters. The harvest is plentiful. Come on, turn to your name and tell them. The harvest is plentiful. I had a meeting with another pastor earlier today, and he said, you realize that there's so many unbelievers out there? I said, yeah, I know. In, in, in their church, they just had a little mini split because another pastor from another church came in and grabbed a whole bunch of people from their church. I said, that's not right. He says, I know. We bless the people that, need, that wanted to go to another church. Let them go. It's fine. We bless them in the mighty name of Jesus. Go, be fruitful, but mul multiply, make that church grow. That's fine. But that's not growth. Come on, turn to your name and tell them, that's not growth. And I told him, it's like you're reading my notes. He said, what are you preaching on tonight? I said, Christ-centered life is kingdom-centered life. Matthew chapter 9, verses 37, 38. And I, I showed him my notes. He says, you gotta, you got to drive this point to your people. you got to drive this point to your people tonight because it's that important. Go ahead and open up Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 and 38. Then, the, the, then he said to his disciples, this is Jesus speaking to the disciples. The harvest... Is plentiful listen there are 97% of New England that is unchurched 
turn to your neighbor and tell them, there's 97% of the people that need Jesus around you. 97%. This pastor that just came and stole a whole bunch of people from this church, that's not kingdom. Come on, turn to your neighbor and tell them, that's not kingdom. Listen, if the people got up and went somewhere else, that's not a problem. But if that pastor comes and grabs them and replants them, I could tell you stories upon stories why that's a bad idea. There's 97% of the people in New England that need Jesus. That's millions upon millions of people that need Jesus. Look around you. You see any seats open around you? These seats, these seats must be filled. Not with believers from other churches, but unbelievers from out there. The 97. Listen, Jesus leaves the 99 to go for the one. Amen. He does. The, the, but he doesn't have a problem with the harvest. Okay? He doesn't have a problem with the harvest. What Jesus has a problem is with the, is with the harvest. So let's read verse 37 one more time. The harvest is plentiful. There's plenty of people who need Jesus. There's plenty of people who need to be prayed for, delivered, set free. Amen. Listen, we're about to have some major miracles in this church. Amen. We're about to. That, those cameras... And we'll, we'll set up more cameras to catch the action because there's, about, there, there's an upbringing of the Spirit that's happening. It's going to continue and increase. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your sons and your daughters will be here. Your sons and your daughters will be healed, delivered, set free in this place. But the workers are few. There's plenty of work to do. If you can preach better than me, come up here and preach. Listen, on Sunday, I had my wife preach. Before I, before I had my wife preach, I called three other pastors who did not pick up the phone. Those that don't have a, a regular church service to go to on a Sunday, I called three to see if they can preach for me because I was losing my voice. But the Lord gave me my voice back, and I asked my wife, and she says, I got a burning inside of me that I need to release. I said, honey, you should have spoke to me earlier. I don't need an act of God in order to release you to do something, amen? The workers are few. That is the problem. Not the harvest is the problem. The workers are the problem. Come on, turn to your neighbor and tell them, are you the problem? I won't be the problem. I will, I will do whatever it takes to get the harvest in the doors. One of the pastors I know said, I will do anything short of sin to get people through these doors. Amen. Yes, I would. Anything short of sin, I will get them through these doors. Why? Because I want them to experience what I've experienced. I want them to experience the God that I know. I want them to experience the healings and miracles, the signs and the wonders. I want them to experience the freedom who the Son set free is free indeed. Verse 38. Ask. Say with me. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out the workers into his harvest field. How many are ready to ask the Lord of the harvest to ask? I'm going to be honest with you. You are praying your own death sentence. Because you got to die to yourself. You do. You got to die to yourself. You got to get. How many are comfortable speaking with others? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, how many are introverts? Like you're, you're not comfortable with people. I'll put two hands up. I'm not comfortable with people. If it wasn't the anointing of Holy Ghost on me, I wouldn't want to be talking to you. I'm sorry, but y'all scare me, okay? I'm just being honest with you. Ask my wife. She'll tell you. Sometimes when I go to preach in other places, she needs to pray for me for an hour before I can get on that stage and say two words. And while I'm on that stage, the first two words that come out of my mouth are, you know, I, I can't speak. I feel like Moses. I need an, an interpreter. I need an Aaron to go in front of me and speak for me. Amen. That is the honest to God truth. But here's the thing. When you are about to pray, what you're about to pray, asking God to send out the harvesters, to send out the workers, God's going to say, I'm sending you. God's going to say, I am sending you. I am giving you boldness. Oh, come on. How many ready for boldness? If you're ready for boldness, then get up. Get off your blessed assurances and let's stand. Let's get ready. Because the God of, this, of the universe is about to anoint you and appoint you in this place. I feel his presence. I feel his presence from the moment I walk into this place. He's about to uh, tear the roof off this place. Amen. He's about to. He's about to change a few things in my heart, in your heart, in your heart, in your heart, in your heart.
want to leave you with this last verse. John 15, 5. John 15, 5. J Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Without me, you could do nothing. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Listen, how many want God to use you mightily? Come on, raise your hand. Raise it up high. I see just about everybody standing because God is about to anoint you, appoint you, and give you some boldness. He's, he's about to anoint you, appoint you, to give you some boldness. But you must remain in Him and He remain in you. You must stay in this Word. Listen, I've added nothing of myself. I've given you every, every verse that is found in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. I've given you nothing of myself. I've given you everything that's in here. Every point that I came up, you will find it in, uh, in those couple of verses. Oh, there's a lot more points. I just gave you all that God gave me to give you tonight. You must remain in Him. You must remain in the church. You must continue to seek His face. You must continue to put His kingdom first. Not the American kingdom, not the Jewish kingdom, not the kingdoms of this world, but His kingdom. His kingdom and His righteousness. And when you do that, He's going to give you a harvest. A harvest of souls. He's going to anoint you and appoint you and give you some boldness. Come on, pray with me. Jesus, I want this anointing. I want you to call me out, God. Even tonight, God, I want you to call me out. Call me out, Lord. Give me that boldness. Give me that boldness. Give me that ability to speak to people, to call people into your kingdom. God, because I believe that a Christ-centered life is a kingdom-centered life. Now, Father, you see every hand that is up. You heard every prayer that was uh, prayed in this place tonight. God, right now, I ask you to anoint them and appoint them and give them some boldness to go out and make disciples just like you uh, asked us to do. Jesus, I thank you that you have given us that your authority as given in, in Matthew 28. You said, what well, all authorities on heaven and on earth is given to me now, go. God, thank you for sending us and telling us to go. Our God, give us boldness. May the spirit of boldness come over this place and fill each one of us to overflow. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen.